ministry here. I'd like to have you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8 this morning, Revelation chapter 8, and as we, before we do that, I want to have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the day that you've given us, and thank you for this time that you've enabled us to be alive. What a day, and, and the things we are seeing transpire in our world ought to instill in us a desire to draw closer to you and closer to one another as we see the time nearing for the return of your son. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live in light of his return, live in light of the reality that we love his appearing, live in light of the hope that that provides for us in darkening days. And we commit to you this time this morning. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. It's my contention, and my belief, and my conviction, that the bulk of the material, the revelation that we have in the book of Revelation is yet future future to our day, as God deals with creation like he's never dealt with it before, and especially the creation, the, the things that we're going to see transpire, excuse me, transpire on the earth. When I was studying this this week, as I was going back through this, it just really struck me, things are going to get really bad Life is going to get very, very, very difficult during this seven-year period of time known as the tribulation. We think things are bad now, and we're going we're gonna to look at the first trumpet, and I'm going to make a, a comparison to what, what is something that is happening now. We're not, we're not even close to that. This is going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible time. And as I was, I was thinking about this this morning, I, I just, it just really hits me that this is all the wrath of God that's being poured out. That God is really angry at this point in time with the inhabitants of the earth, with them that dwell on the earth. We'll see that uh, in a moment. And what is going to happen is going to reveal the fury and the anger and the wrath that God feels, that God has for mankind. Because, that, because men have rejected him, because men have refused to bow the knee to him, I thank the Lord, I, I really do, I thank the Lord that he has promised us deliverance as a body, as the church, that he has promised us deliverance from this terrible time. And I think people who think and people who believe that the church will go through this terrible time do not understand how bad this really is going to be. And they don't understand the nature of this. This is going to be awful. This, I mean, Jesus, when Jesus says that 
The days of the tribulation, if the days of the tribulation had not been shortened, no flesh would be saved. You think he's using hyperbole? Do you think he's using exaggeration there? He really meant that. If, if the tribulation had run as long as Satan desires, as long as fallen man desires, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, Jesus says, those days will be shortened. Anyway, how bad could this really be? Well, look at verse 1. There's an interesting statement here that John makes, or John says, John writes. When the seventh seal is opened, notice this, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, I believe that there is absolutely nothing recorded in the Bible for us that is there to fill up space on the page because John didn't have anything else to say or, or God didn't have anything else to say. Everything in Scripture is there for a purpose. And that statement, there is silence in heaven for a half an hour, is stunning. And it's to get our attention. Because think about this. In Revelation 4, starting in Revelation 4, we have the scene in heaven, right? And you have God on the throne, and you have the four living creatures, and you have the 24 elders, and all of the activity that's going on in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And they're praising God, and they're singing to God. So you have all of this, not noise, but you have all of this sound, and all of a sudden, John says, when the sixth seal, or when the seventh seal is open, silence. Have you ever been someplace where it's totally silent, completely silent, soundproof, a soundproof room? It gets your attention because we're always, we always are surrounded by noise. We were told when we, uh, when we adopted our dog, we were told... When you leave her alone, turn on the radio or the TV because they like to have noise. Even dogs like to have noise. Even dogs like to hear sound. It's very unnerving and unsettling when you don't hear anything. When we lived in the Midwest, I can remember storms that would roll through the area. And when we would have a tornado there would be a calm just before the tornado hits. There's this unnerving calm. You think, oh, well, good. It's not raining. It's not, it's, the wind's not blowing. And you, you know, what's well, good? But then all of a sudden, the tornado descends and the destruction begins. The calm before the storm. When John says... There's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I think the inhabitants of heaven recognize what is going to happen on the earth, and they just pause. Because it's really going to get bad. And in verse 2, it says, when he saw the, the angel... The angels stood before God, the seven angels stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. Now you're going to have these angels involved in the judgment of God that's about to fall on the earth. And another angel, that is an eighth angel, comes along and he takes, he, he stands at the altar, he has a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, if you remember back in chapter, uh, in chapter 6, I believe it's where the, these, 
these creatures, these, these men are crying in verse, in verse 10. It says in verse six, chapter 6, verse 10, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The question they want to know is, how long are you going to delay your judgment? And I think in Revelation chapter 7, God answers that. This is, this is the answer that God is going to give. These trumpet judgments are going to begin to pour out God's wrath. And the angel, it says that in verse 5, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And in verse 7, we hear this sound, or we read of this sound. The first angel sounds. The first angel blows his trumpet. And, and that's interesting that God uses this instrument of this, this trumpet, that God uses these trumpets to announce these coming judgments, to announce these impending, it really is impending doom that's coming on the earth. God, this isn't the first time that God has used trumpets. God used trumpets in the Old Testament to call the people to worship. He called the people to battle. He called the people to assemble. He, he uses trumpets in, for different things. This time, he's going to use the trumpets to announce the judgment that's about to fall. And the first trumpet sounds, and it says... Hail and fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth. Can you imagine that? That's something that's never happened before, right? Haven't you been paying attention to what Pastor Matt's been talking about in Exodus? Of course it has. But now... It's not just restricted to one nation or one region. This is going to be all over the world. Can you imagine hail and fire mingled with blood falling upon the earth? Now watch what happens when this judgment transpires. Third part of the trees was burnt up. A third part of the trees, the forest, gone. Think about this, because this has, these things all have what's called a domino effect on everything. What happens when things, when, when supplies become rare or diminish. Supply and demand. You know, we, we've experienced the last year or two years, we've experienced something that, frankly, I never thought we would ever experience in, in our country. Shortages. And... Last week, when I was, when I was home with my mom, uh, she's getting a new deck built on her house, and she has all the, the supplies. Now all the supplies are delivered. They're, they're at her house. And I remember I was sitting there looking at the supplies that she has. And this, this new deck that she's having built is... That this is a deck, okay? It's over $10,000 for this deck. Now, I know that includes labor and all that, but I thought, that's $10,000 worth of material. My parents, when they bought their house in 1972, paid $28,000 for the house, that included electrical and plumbing and heat and air conditioning. That included all of it. Twenty-eight, I think it was $28,500 they paid for their house. And there was a little patio pad out back. Now she's getting this deck. 
$10,000. When the, part of the reason that that's so much is because everything is, the, the material is in such short supply. Think about this. When a third of the trees vanish or are destroyed, what's going to happen? Lumber is going to be short. Paper is going to be in short supply. I mean, all of this has such a domino effect on mankind. But notice what it says, too. All the green grass was burnt up. All the green grass. I mean, when, when you think about green grass, when you think about lush lawns and, and uh, you think about nice manicured uh, places and things like that, you think of wealth and prosperity, you think of blessing, it's all gone. That's the first judgment. That's the first one. Well, it can't get any worse, right? Look at verse 8. The second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Well, that's never happened before. The sea never turned to blood. Water never turned to blood, right? Again, aren't you listening don't you hear, didn't you hear what Pastor Matt went through in the plagues of Egypt? But this time, it says a third part of the sea was turned to blood. What's going to happen when the sea turns to blood? Look at verse 9. The third part of cre the creatures which are in the sea and had life died. Can you imagine that? Sea life will be destroyed, at least by or, or uh, the, the amount of one-third. Again, it has a domino effect. It's every sea creature. And I know there are a lot of people all over the world that depend on the sea for nutrition, for food. What's going to happen there? It's going to affect people's pocketbook. It's going to affect people's ability to eat. It's not just, you know, oh, well, we're going to have all these dead sea creatures floating around. We'll have that. But it gets worse. The third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, there's some people who think this is going to be this could possibly be all over the world. All over the place, a third part of the ships could be destroyed. You'll have a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit in Asia, a little bit in Africa, a little bit in North America, a little bit in Europe. That's not necessarily true. It may be that this is just localized and this, when this mountain falls, when this mountain hits or this, this, uh, this uh, burning mountain-like uh, object hits the earth, it might be that it's all in one location. And all the ships, could you imagine what would happen right now if this happened in Shanghai, China? What would happen to all those ships? Or the port of Los Angeles, what would happen to all those ships? They'd vanish. Can you imagine the commercial ships, third of them destroyed, the, the military ships, third of them destroyed. Uh, pleasure ships, third of them destroyed. Stunning. Well, it can't get any worse. Look at verse 10. The third angel sounded, and there, was, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. This is fresh water now. This the first judgment or the second judgment fell on the sea life. Now we're getting into the fresh water. What's going to happen? Do, do, I'm glad we don't depend on water for survival, right? A 
Again, a domino effect. And he says in verse 11, the name of the star is called Wormwood. I think that's interesting because Job tells us that God himself names the stars. God knows the stars. God named the stars. He calls them all by name. This one has the name Wormwood. And I think it is, it is some kind of stellar body that's out there. And it's going to fall on the earth. And it's called Wormwood. And guess what happens? The third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, as I was looking at this and thinking about this, thinking through this, I thought, it's not just that the water tastes sour. Have you ever had sour water? Have you ever drank water or you drink water and it just doesn't taste good? It's kind of bitter. I don't think that's all that's going on here. It does taste that way. But I think what he's talking about is it becomes deadly poisonous. Maybe it's uh, got some kind of radiation. I don't know. See, here again, I know this. I'm not going to be here when this happens. We're not going to experience this. But it says, many men died because they were made bitter. It's interesting, again, go back to the plagues of Egypt. And when, when Israel was coming out of Egypt, they, they came to Marah and they tasted the water and it was bitter. And God told Moses to put a tree, put this a certain tree into the water and it would, make, it would make the water sweet. There's nothing, there is nothing that can be done for this. Many men will die. Well, it can't get any worse. Look at verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. What happened during the six days of creation? God made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. Why did He make the sun, moon, and stars? To shine their light on the earth. That's the purpose of, of those heavenly bodies. Now God is going to take part of that away. There's, there's that about stability and reliability. The sun and the moon and the stars provide for us. You know, we can't live without sunlight. We depend on the moon. The tides depend on the moon. I mean... There, there is so much uh, that, that God has designed, that God has created into those heavenly bodies to serve a purpose. And they will, and they do. But all of a sudden, God says when this fourth angel sounds, he's going to remove some of that. How unnerving will that be? How, how, how will that shake people's confidence? We're going to read about this later, right? When people see all these things begin to happen, they're going to repent and they're going to turn to God and they're going to say, oh, Lord, we're sorry. Not at all. They're bent on shaking their fist and refusing to bow the knee. Despite all this. Now watch what he says in verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason 
of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. You have to really, and you should, study carefully the uses in Scripture of this term, woe. Isaiah uses it in Isaiah chapter 5 several times. Isaiah 5.20, a memory verse that, that we had in our previous ministry. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When the Bible uses this term woe, it indicates there is a calamity coming or a calamity that is occurring. It is, it is something that is absolutely devastating that is about to take place or that is taking place. Back in Matthew chapter 11, I, we, we could turn there for just a moment. Matthew chapter 11, I think it is. Yeah, Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 20, the Lord uh, says in verse 20, Then began he, that is Christ, to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Now watch what he says. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And he goes on in, in, uh, about Capernaum and illustrates it with uh, what had, if what had been done in Capernaum had been done in Sodom. They would have repented. Woe is an indication of something calamitous, something that is impending, about to befall. The in and notice who it is that he's addressing, the angel is addressing. He says, the inhabitants of the earth. It's not just the earth's population in general, it's people, as I've said, this, this phrase is an indication of people who have sunk them, their very existence down into this world. It, it, their lives are wrapped around everything that is involved in this, in this life. This is their best life now. Pun intended. They live for this world. Their citizenship is this world. They want everything uh, that this world has to offer and then some. And they're going to see, as, as you go through this, you're going to see everything is going to be pulled out from under. The rug is going to just disappear. But it's going to get worse Notice in verse 1 of chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, let me say this. I think this star is a reference to an angel, and a specific angel, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I think it's a reference to a person, to an individual, to a, a being, to an entity, because it uses personal pronouns here. He's not talking about, you know, one of the stars that God created, like Alpha Centaur or whatever. Uh, he's not talking about something like that, a, a material, uh, 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 material place. He's talking about an angel, but it's a fallen angel. And it's a specific fallen angel. I think he's talking about Satan. I think he's given this key to this bottomless pit. 
And I think this is going to occur at the middle of the tribulation when, he, when this angel falls from heaven. We'll, we'll read about this in chapter 12. But when, when uh, Michael and his angels fight against the devil and his angels, and, and Michael and his angels will win, and they will cast Satan out of heaven, and Satan will no longer be in heaven. I think this is the time that that happens. Satan is cast down to this bottomless pit. Not to enter it, but to release those angels, those fallen angels who have occupied it. And he opens the bottomless pit and great smoke. There, there arose smoke out of the pit, a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the, of the pit, smoke of the pit. And there came out not just the smoke, but there came out locusts upon the earth. I don't think, I was, I was walking yesterday down the street, and right in the middle of the street, there was a little bug. And I didn't step on it. I left it alone. And Lexi didn't bother it. She left it alone. I don't think she even saw it. But it was, it was a locust. And when you see a locust today, when I see a locust today, I know they're going to go after plants and they're going to go after green things. They're going to they're consume green things. That's not what these locusts do. This tells me these are not little insects. These are demons. Terrible, frightening demons. Listen to the description that, that he gives us in verse, in verse 3. Unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. I have never seen a scorpion. I have no desire to ever see a scorpion. If I see a scorpion, I will run, and I will scream, not as loud as I would scream if I saw a snake. These scorpions, these locusts, these demons, listen to what it says, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing neither any tree. But what can they hurt? Only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And you know what? That's going to be a lot of people. That's going to be most of the population of the world. They will not have the seal of God on their forehead. You know, we, we, if you read chapter 7, you know the seal of God on their foreheads was on the 144,000, the Jews, the Jewish, the Jewish uh, evangelists or Jewish uh, missionaries. Watch what they do. In verse 5, it says, To them it was given that they should not kill them, well, that's good, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. They don't kill, they just torment. Think about this. We're approaching the end of May, right? day after tomorrow is the May 31st, right? Think. So it would be like this happening January 1st until May 31st. That long. Can you remember what was going on back in January? I know Brian he can't remember what happened an hour ago. But can you, can you remember things that long ago? 
And for that period of time, it says they're not killing men. They're just inflicting torment on them. They're just inflicting pain on them. I, I was... Now, again, I've not seen a scorpion. I have no intention or desire to see one. But I'm told, I, I was reading, I'm told that generally if someone is stung with a scorpion, the pain might last a few hours or a couple of days or a week or so. It might, it might be that long. But five months, can you imagine that? Five months of pain. Five months of torment. How bad will it be for men? Verse 6. In those days, men shall seek death. It will be so horrific, men will want to die. Just let me die. I've had enough. But it says they shall not find it. They can't. And, and they think, well, death will bring relief. Death won't bring relief. Death, death will make it even worse for them because of what happens in uh, the afterlife for them. But anyway, they shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. It, it, he repeats that. They can't even die. Now watch verse 7. It says the shapes of the locusts. This tells me this is not, these are not normal locusts. These are not humans. These are demonic beings. Listen to the description. The locusts were like horses prepared for battle. I mean, that, that tells us that these are fierce warrior type beings. On their heads, as it were, were crowns like gold. And their faces were like the faces of, as the faces of men. It doesn't say they were men's faces. It says they were faces as the faces of men. They had a human appearance in some form. And their hair was the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. I mean, I think this is such a an interesting dynamic, an interesting description of these. Because the last time I looked, horses had flat teeth, and they bite. I know they bite. Daddy, they bite. And they bite hard. When they bite you right here on your shoulder, it hurts. But they don't break the, they don't break the skin, generally. If a lion bites you, here or here, you're done. These are fierce creatures. They had breastplates as, were, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Can you imagine how fearful they look, how fearful they appear, how frightening, and how frightening they sound? It's loud. And they had tails like tails of scorpions. And their stings were in their tails, and power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. Those two names, Greek and Hebrew, both mean the same thing, destroyer. He's the destroyer. And that's why I think this is Satan. Because he is the destroyer. You know, today, Satan appears as this angel of light. And he's very deceptive. When this happens, the facade is coming off. And men will see him for as he is. Men will see the reality of Satan. He is a destroyer. He's not a builder. He's not an encourager. He's a deceiver today. But then, then his, his colors will come out. His character will come out. Well, our time is gone. 
And I wanted, to get, I wanted to get through all six of these in these two chapters, but we're not going to make it. We're just, I, because I want to take some time with, with the sixth trumpet and talk about this. This is, this is a time when things are really going to unravel from a human perspective. From God's perspective, it's falling into place. Everything is going to work out. Because we're, we're working toward one particular chapter in this book. It's chapter 19. When Jesus comes back and begins his rule and reign. Father, thank you for this time together and thank you for the opportunity we have to just consider this, these judgments. I pray that you would help us to begin to understand how horrific this will be and to appreciate the reality. Not, not that we deserve it, we don't, but that we are promised deliverance from this hour of tribulation that will come upon them that dwell on the earth. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the assurances Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the, the great love that you provide, the mercy and the grace that you've given us. Lord, we thank you now for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.